Hallo, willkommen bei Agrafi, dem Podcast über produktives wissenschaftliches Arbeiten. Mein Name ist Dominik Fröhlich und in diesem Podcast geht es vor allem um eins. Wir wollen produktives wissenschaftliches Arbeiten aus vielen verschiedenen Perspektiven beleuchten. Dafür führe ich Gespräche mit Personen, die sich aktiv mit wissenschaftlichem Arbeiten beschäftigen. Ganz egal, ob Studentin, Trainer oder Professorin. Wir thematisieren Herausforderungen im Schreiben und Wege, diese Herausforderungen zu meistern. Right, today in, this, in my studio is Bart. Hi Bart. Hello. So Bart is a university professor from the UK, from Open University, and he's a very prolific writer. It's very, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about talking to you. Tell me a bit about your writing, like how do you approach your writing, like in a very general sense? What, what do you like about writing? Um, what's your general stance towards writing? Is it just because you need to do it? Is there some love for writing? Because I recently saw this paper on love, academic writing as love. <laughs> Is there anything you want to share? Um, very good question. Uh, maybe if I start with my own journey, and every journey will be slightly different. I had to publish in order to stay in my job, and I loved the job that I was doing, and I never really enjoyed writing. But quite surprisingly, while starting to write and starting to put my wild ideas on paper, um, I started to slowly enjoy the process of writing. But I, I, I. In my PhD, I never really enjoyed writing because I was always forced to write pieces. But eventually, I developed a kind of mindset of, okay, I know more or less how to write because I've learned it. I think writing is a skill. So you have to spend a lot of time continuously writing and writing and writing and then getting feedback and then writing more. Um, and then eventually, I came to a point where I'm like, wow. I can write anything I want. And that was really a creative um, eye-opener. And from that moment on, I'm just a curious person. And I think it's cool that, yeah, whatever you want, you can start to write about. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned becoming better as a writer. And you mentioned feedback and well, just engaging mm -hmm. your practice. Is there anything else you can think of or any any... Anything you can recommend of how to become a better writer? I think it is really essential that you combine practice with looking at how other people write. So one of the tips I got from my uh, PhD supervisor, Professor Wim Geislas, was take an article that really resonates with you and try to unpack why does it resonate with you and what is the kind of style and approach that that particular article or book or piece of writing that you really like and what is the kind of stylistic trick that they use and once you find an article that really resonates with you try to see okay can i use some of those stylistic tricks to perhaps make that yourself But at the same time, I think what is really important is there's a, um, no right way of writing. It has to come from you, from inside you. And I think the only way to become a better writer is to continuously write. So one of the tips I give my own PhD students, and this is a tip which works well for me, and it might not work right, well for others, is I write and then I leave it to rest for two or three days. And then you realize that your brain is a really complex animal uh, because what you wrote when you were sitting behind your computer or laptop made perfect sense at that point in time when, when you're revisiting it three or four days afterwards, you're like, oh my God, what is this? So that's the uh, first step is by revisiting it two or three days later you basically are reviewing your own work as if you are a third person. And I think what worked really well for me, and I've heard other uh, prolific writers do the same, is once I've done the first revision of my own work, I print it out, again, leave it to rest for a day or two, and then I literally read it to myself aloud sitting in a quiet room and my wife hates me for that because I'm always reading myself my own text but if you read your own text out loud you 
you basically have to talk quite slowly. And as a result, you really start to unpick every little line, every little comma. And it becomes a kind of, yeah, eventually you end up with a really nice piece of work because you've revised it yourself already a couple of times before you even send it out for a review or before you even share it with colleagues. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. You mentioned like writing and then taking a rest basically. But what what is writing for you? Is it like, um, do you write on a very continuous basis or do you have more like bigger chunks where you do your writing and then? Um, well, I never really had the luxury to spend weeks thinking about something. So I always had, um, because I was always working at the same time. So I knew that, let's say on Friday, I had four hours to write. But because I knew that I had four hours to write, during the week i already started to think about okay what do i want to write how do i want to write it so when i actually sat down during those four hours on friday i already had my opening statement i knew what i wanted to write and then it eventually just it's quite hard to describe but it eventually just flows but the reason why it flows is that in my mind i already know what i want to say so a, a well-respected colleague from Maastricht University, Sean Hagedorn, he writes papers within one day, but he has spent weeks thinking about the structure and thinking about, okay, this is my main point, this is what I want to argue, but the actual process of writing, he does in his head. So I think many people, when they feel that empty page, they just, oh, let's, let's just write something. But in a way, I think it's much better to, if nothing emerges from that white page, just go and have a walk. And then you, your mind will anyways continuously think about what you potentially might write. And then eventually just getting the first or the second sentence on the screen will probably help you to then build the third sentence or the fourth sentence. Interesting, yeah. Now going a bit back to how you explained or presented how your writing developed in a yeah. way. You first mentioned, okay, it was forced from the outside, basically, the, something that's being forced upon you. And then now you talk about something like you're coming from the inside out, so it seems very internalized and there seems to be some interest from yourself to, to do it, to engage in that kind of activity. Do you see some... Oh, what are like the differences that you see in terms of the process like on the one hand being forced like where, how it was in the past and now being more engaged maybe with the writing process as, as such do you see any differences in terms of the process in terms of the outcome also yeah i think what is really stimulate. i mean everyone has different buttons that either stimulate or prevent them and i think it's really important to know um, which buttons help you to become uh, prolific and my buttons that really help me is my peers so i always write with other people uh, because i find it really inspiring to listen to other people and to hear their thoughts so what i'm always trying to look for in terms of my own writing is i never think about okay i have to write the perfect piece i want to write a, a good piece when at least when i read it out loud it makes sense but then i think the most interesting bit is then when i share this with my colleagues with whom i'm co-publishing and then they provide some really interesting comments that i never think about so for me it's a kind of you might call it a dance in the sense that yeah i find it really inspiring if i can work with different colleagues who continuously give me new ideas and insights and i'm hopefully also inspiring them to think about this and i appreciate when you're writing your phd for example it's quite difficult to have that dance but you can use that metaphor of a dance also with your friends just give your article to a friend and then see how they react to the article and if they understand what you're trying to um, bring across to to make sense of then great then it, hopefully that piece is is uh, has sufficient quality mm -hmm. and okay so you, you're mentioning like co-authoring as, as a way also to to get Yeah, to improve the quality of the writing process as such. Have you also tried something like writing groups where you are joining with others but are not working on the same piece? Is this something that you're engaged in? Um, yeah, I've known that other colleagues and some of my PhD students are heavily involved in those writing groups. I have this weird, um, I don't know, this 
burning desire from the inside of me, a kind of intrinsic motivation that I just love to write. I'm not saying I'm a good writer, but I like to put my wild ideas on paper. And yes, in terms of in academia, you get rewarded by having many publications. But in a way, I find it I find it really nice and relaxing if I can actually write. Um, so I think coming back to our the start of our conversation, I didn't want to write, but I had to. But eventually, I became intrinsically motivated because I enjoy the process of um, of writing, and that's kind of hard to to define. But I think, like with any hobby. Um, if you do something often, you become better, and then eventually, you, you hopefully, if you like that hobby, you eventually, yeah, become quite passionate, and you see this as a, also a kind of space where you can start to relax. And I think for me, the most important thing is I, I literally um, block time. So I turn off my emails, I turn off my phone. Um, in my agenda, my colleagues know on Friday between. 12 and 5 I will not respond to emails and I'm just then writing and sometimes the magic doesn't happen and then it doesn't work and then I go and do something else and then maybe the next day that magical vibe comes in some people call it flow um, and if I'm in a good day I might have time between 12 and 5 and then before I know it it's like 9 o'clock in the evening and I haven't even noticed that it's nine o'clock because you're so immersed in that writing. And I think that's what you're, what you're trying to get at is that writing in a way becomes a natural process. And that I think you can only learn that flow by just doing it. Wow. Well, yeah. That uh, sounds like a very nice writing experience. <laughs> um, the theme, uh, writing phase. Um, I would now like from this more, yeah, passionate yeah. passionate talk to something more technical mm. um, let me just to give the listeners here a bit of context we are currently meeting here at a kind of a colloquium where it's about research, a research method in the end so the question um, that I would like to pose is what's the relationship between the method and the writing because the assumption here being that the process is very different structured because the, the method in a way imposes a certain structure first in terms of how the paper in the end looks like, but also in terms of how the research progresses right, and the thinking progresses. Mm -hmm. So what's your feeling here? Where's, what, is there a relationship? I'm just going to slow a, a throw a slight curveball. Uh, my first paper got rejected three times um, and I went to a, um, a workshop by Sana Yarvela and I was like really upset, like the best paper ever and why does it get rejected all the time? And then she said, the number one reason why you don't get success is that you don't read the journal. So many people think that as long as they write a brilliant paper, the magic will appear. So coming back to your method question, yes, I when I write, I've already analyzed all my data and I know a kind of picture in my head of what I want to write. But I think it's very important before you start to write is to be familiar with your audience and where you want to position your paper so if you know the kind of journal that you're aiming for the type of output you want to deliver then by reading a lot of that output that particular journal will help you to see okay how do other authors structure their arguments how do other uh, methods position the argument and every journal has a kind of unique angle and I think in a way, many people um, who don't know this, they basically miss that the biggest hurdle is not knowing the journal. And so what I try to do as a, as a, apparently a prolific writer is to uh, become a kind of chameleon of that journal. So my writing style is different when I write to higher education or when I write to computers and education, I write in a different way because I'm very familiar with the type of writing of that particular journal. Could you translate that kind of tip also for, for students that might not have the intention to publish in a journal where it's probably easier to observe what like the 
the current style is or what the structure, the required structure is about, but that yeah, you need to hand into some supervisor or to a committee, whatever. I think what is really important in a way is whether you're submitting a thesis or submitting just an assignment is to perhaps look at <clears throat> what other assignments have students in the past um, submitted and what's the style of writing, what's the kind of approach. And some courses make previous exams or previous essays available and you learn so much from seeing what students are actually writing in terms of their style and in terms of their approach. So it is really important to think about, okay, what is my audience, but also to see, okay, what kind of flavor do I have to give that hits the, hits the spots that, that your examiners or your teachers will actually look at. And that's, um, yeah, in a way, uh, it might sound technical, but sometimes I, you know, I would just ask a teacher, "Can you give me an essay that scored really well last year?" Um, and then most teachers are quite happy to share that because then you can start to see, okay, what would be the kind of approach and level that is expected for that particular output. Mm -hmm. And I'll maybe do to wrap it up because yeah. you've already yeah, yeah. filled with so much wisdom. Um, is there any any resource you could recommend, maybe in terms of? Um, getting into writing becoming a better writer or whatever comes to your mind can be can be a text can be any format um one of the things that i think i benefited most from uh, that i mentioned before is writing for yourself and continuous improving but the the the, ne the the next big thing that i've really helped me in my writing is giving it to a person who is not in your field so my wife has read a lot of pieces when I was not very confident in my writing. But if my wife understood what I was writing and having discussions with her, then I knew that I did a good job. So I think the, the, the best tip I can give people is don't be afraid to share your um, papers with people or your output with people who are slightly away from you, but who are with whom you can build a relationship of trust where you can actually give an open conversation about which elements of this particular paragraph make sense and which elements do not make sense. And having that third perspective is extremely useful because if another person who is not an expert in your field understands what you're writing, then the output is, is good. Thank you, Richard. A lot of insightful comments here um, to, to be shared. Uh, with our listeners. So thank you a lot, Bart, for being here. Das war eine weitere Episode von Agraphie, dem Podcast über produktives wissenschaftliches Arbeiten. Wenn es dir gefallen hat, dann hör doch weiter rein. Wenn du Feedback für mich hast, kannst du es mir gerne an agraphie.dominikfröhlich.com schicken. Dafür bin ich immer dankbar. Ansonsten hoffe ich, dass du auch das nächste Mal wieder reinhörst, wenn wir über produktives wissenschaftliches Arbeiten sprechen. Bis dann.